other than that, um, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Again, thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, you've probably noticed um, me say the words library code lab and you may see the little, uh, little square in your upper left-hand corner, a little graphic. Um, what Library Code Lab is, it's just an informal um, learning series that's based on the concepts of accessibility, collaboration, and fun. Um, before the pandemic and even throughout the pandemic, we've offered different types of classes, both staff-led and taught by some amazing partners in the community um, on different coding concepts and ideas. Um, we've done the three basic uh, coding languages that you may have heard of, things like HTML, uh, JavaScript, and uh, CSS. We've also offered um, several career talk roundtable um, discussions where we've had panelists come in and talk about what they do in the different, um, there's so many different careers out there um, if you're interested in programming, computer science, web development or coding. Um, we just actually had a wonderful one um, this past Saturday um, online, and we are hoping to host a part two of that program um, in the future. So stay tuned for when we'll have a part two of our career talk roundtable. Um, and we also have a YouTube channel that has recordings of the um, online programs that we've um, offered in the past. Um, so I would encourage you, that's available on the library's website, to check out our YouTube channel. And so again, just a welcome to our Programming Basics class today. Um, we'll just very briefly dive into some coding concepts, cover how a computer thinks, and talk about some of the languages and how the web works. Just a couple of our objectives. Again, we'll be learning how a computer thinks, um, exploring some core concepts of computer science, um, briefly talk about the different languages, just a few of them, and we'll learn how the web works. And if there aren't any questions, thanks, Hillary, um, I'm going to go on to Oh, and we'll also um, talk about the library resources, but I will go on with what is programming? Does, does anyone know what programming is? Does anyone have a definition they'd want to put in the chat or take a stab at what they think it is? I think it's uh, when you, like you put some code, you, put a, you use a special language to go from point A to point B, something like that. And after from point B to point uh, C. Okay, that's a that's a great that's a great guess. Um, anybody else? Well, according to Khan Academy, I have to give credit where credit's due. Um, programming is the process of creating a set of instructions that tell a computer how to perform a task. And we're going to watch a short little video, and that's kind of how the structure of this, this uh, class is. We're going to watch a lot of little short videos um, that's going to explain what computer science and what programming is. So if I don't have any other comments or questions, I'll move on. Computer science is the art of teaching a computer what to do. I'll start with something similar, like a screwdriver is a tool that is made to kind of turn screws, and on its own, it's useless. You have to take it in your hand and kind of turn it to make, to make something happen. A computer actually learns a set of instructions and actually transforms that into a way of showing a movie or playing an audio file or um, delivering Facebook. And that whole study of how the computer thinks is computer science. It's code, and so code is you know, a bunch of symbols and letters, but uh, it's really more like a language. I got here from Puerto Rico, and I didn't know English. So I had to spend a lot of time trying to perfect my English. Programmers do the same thing. They, they learn new languages to do uh, new things. They are inputting this language and these instructions into the computer so the computer can do what they want them to do. 
Growing up, I was one of the very few people who had access to a computer around me. And I remember being bored one day and I picked up this book um, that was near the computer that said um, basic programming. And they had this really simple getting started, a hello world program that you could write in basic. And I remember writing it and recognizing that, wait, hold on, I just put this thing in and taught this computer how to do that. And it came back out. And I had my brother come in and use it. And he's like, oh man, you made the computer say hello? It's like, yeah, 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 I did. Isn't that cool? In our everyday lives, you speak language and you use that to communicate and instruct when you're around people. Uh, similarly, a programming language is exactly the same thing. It's just a language that you would use to talk to the computer. And think about the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning, let's say it's an alarm clock. There are instructions that somebody put into that alarm clock to teach it how to tell time, how to respond to you hitting the snooze button. You're walking out the house and you jump in your car and you start it. Um, there are lots of computers in there figuring out how to turn the engine the very first time, how much gas to put in. The set of instructions that people have put into all these little devices you've used throughout your day just made your day that much easier to get through. You want directions or you're dialing a phone number, you're actually interacting with a computer to solve the problem at hand. That's computer science and programming right there, every day, in your hand. Programming and computer science is one of the best ways to have impact in the world. There is no other career, no other field where you can touch so many people's lives with just a simple software or a simple app. And it's specifically also important for diverse communities to be involved because of the fact that computers are everywhere, programming is everywhere, and we want an equal representation when we are building programs. We need people who have a broad range of perspectives to find different solutions. Creating products for the people, you need to be the people. And if we hope to have products out there that really serve our needs, we need to be involved. Programming, learning computer science, and being part of the creation process of this new wave of innovation. Right. So I hope everybody enjoyed that little video. Um, so again, um, programming is just the language that you use to talk to a computer. And um, a lot of the times you hear the question, well, what's the difference between programming and coding? Um, best way that I've been able to describe it is um, that coding means writing the code from one language to another, and programming is more general. Um, it's a means of programming the machine that you give the set of instructions from. So that's that's kind of how I differ differentiate between the two. Um, any questions? Well, can any now that we know what a program is, can anyone does anyone want to share in the chat or um, uh, unmute the, their mic and um, talk about what kind of programs you use every day? Um, like, I think you heard the instance in the video, an alarm clock, um, something right here is you know, cell phone. That's got a ton of programs that you use on it every day. Even the crock pot, you know, it's a instant pot, oh. like those, the, those tools in the kitchen that, uh, you plug, it's all electronic lights. Or the yeah, yeah, I think that's a great example. Um, I have not been successful with an Instapot. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am using, I have one, it will be two years in November. <laughs> the, okay, I, I start to use it sometimes, yes. But it's, I, a, it's, it's good, but you know, it's just that. Uh, and I'm I think. To, I'm used to the pressure cooker. But the uh, simple one that you put on the stove, you know, so it just making the step from the pressure cooker that you put on the stove, that the one that you plug and that you close and after you just program and you wait. <laughs> and I think um, with the Instant Pot, you have to tell it very specific instructions, um, yes. depending on what you want it to do, because it offers so many different uh Yes. functions and it can cook so many different dishes in so many different ways but you have to specify uh what direction you want it to go in which is a great uh kind of 
segue into um, how a computer thinks. Um, <laughs> So thanks for that. Um, a computer thinks um, in binary terms. So every decision that it makes is going to be either a yes or a no. So you can think of something like an on or an off switch. Um, a computer also thinks in specifics. Um, they are a computer. They, um, they need detailed instructions about um, what it's going to be doing. So despite um, what it seems like they're becoming. Um, computers, for the most part, are not able to make assumptions. Um, and then third, they need to be logical. Um, they can make decisions as long as we give them enough information or specific um, instructions for a specific situation. And once you've given um, it those specific instructions, it can make a logical decision based on what set of instructions you've given it. Um, basically, that they just need us, a computer needs us to translate our human speak into instructions that, um, that they, they can understand. So just trying to get into the mindset of how a computer thinks, just think of a task or process. Um, you want to break it up into small chunks, make those chunks easy to follow, be as specific and literal as you can be and try to make them hard or impossible to get wrong. And what's obvious to us um, is not gonna be obvious to computers. And um, the video on the next slide, um, it's, a, it's a little bit of an older video, some of you may have seen before, but um, it's gonna kind of demonstrate in plain language what, um, how important it is to be as specific as possible and how that would translate when you start thinking about um, programming, writing your first program and eventually going on to code, uh, writing code. So I'm gonna move on to this next video. Unless there are any questions. On both halves. <laughs> Apply two tablespoons of peanut butter in the same way. Step four, join the two halves. <laughs> and step five, perhaps coupled with a round of applause, have fun. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> thank you very much to our volunteers. Um, the, the sandwiches are yours. So <laughs> suffice it to say that there's room for improvement in something like this. And this might seem like a ridiculous visual, but the reality is when it comes time this semester to instruct a computer to do something, you'll be surprised just how often and how bad you are at that when you're doing this, most likely for the very first time. <laughs> when you're doing this for the very first time. And so among the lessons that will become ingrained over time, honestly, is truly how to think more carefully, how to think more precisely, and in turn, how to express yourself, if you can just take the tables with you, how to express yourself more methodically so that the person hearing your counsel, the person hearing and taking your instructions can actually implement them correctly. All right, I hope everybody enjoyed that video. That's a little bit of a classic, how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Um, our next activity, um, we're going to do something similar. If you, um, 
received my email yesterday, you likely got um, an attachment that had um, a picture on it. And as you can see on the slide in front of you, you see in our activity number one, it's going to say draw a pumpkin. Well, I'm not going to ask you guys to draw a pumpkin. I'm going to ask you guys to tell me how to draw a pumpkin. And I'm going to use my handy little uh, drawing tool um, in Zoom based on your instructions on how to draw a pumpkin, based on um, what picture you received in that um, attachment in your email. You can either um, shout out your instructions or if you want to put them in chat. Um, and again, I am going to interpret them literally. Um, so I can't wait to, to hear from, from you all. <laughs> That's not easy. Yeah. <laughs> so, and if you if you don't have the attachment, if you can just think of what a pumpkin looks like, and then tell me how to you uh, tell me what to do. So I I have myself. I am already stuck to tell you. Do you to tell you maybe to draw to draw like an oval, but it's not. Uh, I'm just thinking about uh, the shape of. Uh, I don't know, in, in sport, there is not a shape that it will be easier. Baseball, no, I, I'm not too familiar with all those. Uh... So, so I just draw, draw an oval on my screen. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Try with so that. That, that, that's an oval. Does that look kind of like an oval? Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. And... Anybody um, else want to? Can you change the color of your pen, Christy? I can. Um, so now. <laughs> and I'll just keep changing my color. It's pink. Maybe draw a green triangle on top. Okay. Oh, I didn't say on top of where, did I? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody I help me out. <laughs> I will say from the middle of the top oval, from the middle, middle of the top of all, right? Draw like a L, but uh, that it's windy. Uh, lowercase L, the letter L, that it's windy going to bending to the right. Okay, so I think you said, oops, I need my draw tool back. I think you said on top of the top oval, a lowercase L. From, oh. from, from the middle of the top of the pumpkin. Oh, with, um, middle right here. All right. Draw okay. a, L, a lowercase L okay. that it's bending to the right. That is bending to the right, like that? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Well, I come to your one, something like that. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Anything else? I should have tell uh, slightly bending. <laughs> So how does how does my pumpkin drawing on the screen compare to what drawing I sent out as an as, as an attachment? Is it looking pretty close? Mm, no, it's a bit <laughs> because you know, it's not easy to teach you how to make those lines on the pumpkin, those curved line that curved. we see. You know, inside the oval, you have to do. Uh, curved like uh, like to draw bananas it's like drawing bananas inside the oh, okay so kind of like that but <laughs> it would be better the other way but uh... <laughs> should okay. they 
Should I keep drawing the lines or should I change? Voilà, for no, no, it would be nice. You will erase the first one on the left and you will draw them on the other way. <laughs> uh -huh. Anything else that I need to add? <laughs> Triangles, but how to explain to you where to put them? Ah, maybe if we think that you have some knowledge of the body part, okay, can you just put two triangles on the, uh, on the, on the higher part of the oval, but inside, huh? inside okay. the oval, on the higher, highest part, put two triangles beside, but keep a small space. Huh? Okay, so two triangles inside the oval, but the close eyes. together where the eyes would be. So kind of like that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at the end we'll have something who looks like a pumpkin. Okay. Uh, and after you have to do another, a smaller one, a smaller triangle uh, under those two triangles, but leave some space between. In the middle of those two triangles, in so the right low, here? No, in, a little okay. bit lower. Okay. Um, you said a little bit lower. Whoops, that's not what I want. So both right here? Yes, perfect. Okay. Okay. Anything else? <laughs> Draw a big smile under. <laughs> a big smile. <laughs> under this triangle. Under the oh, small. And... So where do I need to draw my smile? Under the small triangle. Under the small triangle. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so that that I think is is that a a pumpkin? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, okay, yeah. it's a pumpkin, but something bad happened to it. A pumpkin that something bad happened to it. I like that description. <laughs> I I think um, hopefully this little exercise did, does that kind of explain. Um, how specific you have to be when you're uh, when you start thinking of like a computer that you have to give a lot of detailed directions and what that basically means um, is again be specific and I interpreted the instructions with the tool um, but what did you guys learn? The do I think the the image by the image. I don't know how to express that, but uh, the it's really telling you that you know it will be easier if I put my image on the I have my paper and I show you how to do it. You know, it's uh, because like just oral oral instruction. Oof, my goodness, it's uh, tough. You know. Okay. And then in our next, in the next little video, um, this will, this will make a, um, be a little bit more clearer. Um, it's going to go over a little bit about building a program and how you get a computer to do something without you literally telling it to do every single step. Um, it's something called an algorithm. Um, we're going to go on to that video now, unless there are any other questions. You may have heard the term algorithm recently, whether it was online or maybe in some conversation about technology. It's a word that gets thrown around a lot, but what exactly does it mean? Well, simply put, an algorithm is a set of steps used to complete a specific task. They're the building blocks for programming, and they allow things like computers, smartphones, and websites to function and make decisions. But in addition to being used by technology, a lot of things we do on a daily basis are also similar to algorithms. 
Let's say you want to make some spaghetti. In order to do this successfully, there's a certain set of steps you need to follow in a particular order. First, you need to boil a pot of water. Once it's boiling, you then add the spaghetti and cook it for a set amount of time, stirring occasionally. Once it's finished, you drain the water and then it's ready to be served with a sauce of your choice. That entire process is actually an algorithm. Because you followed those steps in that order, you reached your desired outcome, a delicious pasta dish. But if you were to make a mistake, say over or under cooking your noodles, it probably wouldn't be as good. Programs work in a similar way. Their code is made up of algorithms telling them what to do. Let's say that we want to use a navigation app to get directions. When we punch in a destination, the app uses an algorithm to look at the various available routes. Next, it uses a different algorithm to check the current traffic. And then a third one takes that information and calculates the best available route. All of these algorithms are built right into the app's code. If there were any kind of error in that code, the app wouldn't be able to follow these algorithms correctly, meaning you wouldn't receive your directions. Both of these examples show how both humans and computers can use algorithms to perform everyday tasks. The difference is that computers can use algorithms and calculate things better, faster, and more efficiently than we can. Technology is only going to continue to evolve and get even better at what it does. As long as coding and programming continue to be used, algorithms will be at the heart of these technologies, guiding what they do and how they do it. GCF Global. Right. So, um, moving on, um, next we're going to move into a little discussion about um, some core computer science concepts. Um, and what you're going to see on the left side of your of the graphic um, is something called um, it looks like a flow chart. And we're going to use this in a little exercise in just a minute. But this flow chart, um, it's just a helpful way to describe the set, the, the, the set of steps in your or your algorithm. And so when computer programmers write this code, um, they need to be able to give the computer specific and sequential instructions. These types of flow charts just help out um, programmers to work these steps out kind of in, in longhand um, before they actually translate it into um, the, the code that you may have seen where it, it looks like a, a bunch of letters and punctuation and things that don't make a lot a whole lot of sense. Um, and they do this by incorporating some of these core concepts. Um, that um, we'll be using um, variations of these when we write out a little program in just a minute. Um, so the first one of these concepts is something called a variable. Um, that's something that just stores information um, and like your name or your email address or your age. And so what you can do is create a variable name and have that um, user store the information to that variable. Then we've got something called a loop. Um, and that's what we um, use to tell us how and when to repeat a command or a set of instructions until something changes at a set point. Um, and then we have something called a condition, a conditional. And that lets you um, set the logic for um, your computer to use to make a decision. Um, it's also known as an, um, an if or else statement. Um, best example, a really good common example of express of um, understanding a conditional is um, think of something like any sort of website that requires um, you to input your age, um, like a, a brewery website. Um, basically, if you meet, if it's going to ask you, do you meet the certain age requirement of being 21 and up? If you say, if you do meet that requirement, it takes you onto the website. If else, which would mean like if you were 19, um, it would take you to another website. And then finally, um, we've got functions. And functions are just a set, um, saved set of instructions um, that you can use that doesn't make you have to keep writing the same code over and over. All right. 
Okay, um, so here's another example of a completed um, flow chart in something called pseudocode. Um, and again, these are useful um, problem solving tools that developers, um, they use when they're thinking about um, a, an actual problem that they'll eventually have to write out um, the code for, but it's just a way for them to be able to put in um, regular language and they work out these steps before they translate that into um, the actual code. Um, pseudocode lets you set the condition um, and what you want your problem to meet um, or not meet. And um, it's kind of like an outline for a research paper. If you can think of it that way, it actually kind of looks like um, many, many, many years ago when I um, wrote research papers, I think um, this is something that we kind of use. Um, and another way of thinking of a flow chart, um, it's just a graphic representation of an algorithm. Um, so here we have where um, on the example on the screen, we've got our problem is that the cat is meowing for food at four in the morning. Um, and we've got our conditions that if it continues to meow before 6 a.m., if that's true, we're going to follow a set of specific tasks or instructions where we grab our water bottle, we aim it at a cat, at our cat, and we squirt it at the cat until the cat leaves. And it just keeps looping and looping and looping until 6 a.m. because that's when we want to wake up if it stops, that's where it ends. Um, I've got another example on the next page. Um, kind of what happens when we make a cup of tea. Um, that's so we fill our kettle, we heat up the water. If the water has not boiled, it's going to loop back around to heating up the water again. If it has boiled, then we made our tea. And um, just if you're wondering about the different shapes, like why, if, if there's a reason for using the ovals and the square or the rectangles and the diamonds, um, the ovals, I believe, um, represent the start and the end. Um, the squares means it's a behavior that you're going to perform or execute. And the diamond is your decision point or your condition. So again, making a decision, has the water boiled? No, loop back around until the water heats up. If it has boiled, um, you're through and your, your, your tea is made. Um, let's see. So now um, the next thing we're going to do, um, again, if you've got the uh, attachment that was sent in your email, um, you can pull that up as a guide, but um, on the next screen, I do have um, a little uh, flow chart that's blank. Um, if you want to take just a, a couple of minutes to jot down um, your first program, we're going to build a little program here. Um, and just what you can think of, um, you're going to be writing it, your program in plain language um, and think about what you want it to, uh, what do you want it to do? What event do you want to begin it? And um, when do you want the process to stop? And if you're not really sure where to get started, I did include a couple of examples here. Um, you can do it for anything, but I've got um, making a sandwich, directions, uh, directions to somewhere, programming an alarm clock. Um, if we just want to take just a couple of minutes just to jot something down and then meet back here in just a few minutes and if anybody would like to share i think i would like to do something like a bedtime alarm for my daughter because uh oh my goodness to put her in bed it's not easy eh? she has always time so that would be nice to something okay. like um do you want to write it out or do you want to me to write it on the screen or? Let me think. I have to you think, want to think. Yeah, you can think about it for just a few minutes. Yes, yes.
And also, if anybody wants to put anything in the chat, they're welcome to do that too. And when you're done, if you want to just put something in the chat or just letting us know that you're done, if you'd like to share, I'd love to hear from what you guys came up with. If not, that's okay too. How's it going out there? Does anybody want to share? Or do you need a little more time? I can get us started if you want. I'm not sure how thorough my program is, but I try to do boiling eggs. Okay. So my condition is I want my eggs to be boiled for eight minutes. So I think that's usually what works for me. Eight minutes. Okay. So my first task was to fill pot with water. Okay. And then my second task was to put my eggs in the pot. Okay. And then third one was turn on the burner 
until it reaches a rolling boil. Okay. And then I guess it cycles until it's eight minutes and then it's done. Yeah, because if it didn't, you would just keep checking, I guess, cast three until it boils, right? Because if yeah, it, because so. once the, um, once it reaches the boiling part, that's where you would, that's, that's when you've met the condition, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Hillary. Thanks. Anybody else? I don't know. I'm not completely finished, but uh, it will be. Because I, I started to answer the question on the left, in fact. What do you want your program to do? Okay. I think I would like, so I will answer my question after I know where do they go exactly. Uh, I think I would like to program two, two alarm, two alarms clock with a lap of one hour. For example, if I want her to be in bed at 8.30, oh, I am answering the, okay, I continue. Two, uh, when do I want the, pro the process to stop? So 8.30, because I want her to be in bed at 8.30. Uh, and question three, what event do I want to begin the program? But I, what event? So I want a reminder. Bye. So that's why after I thought, okay, what I want, what do you want your program to do is, I want to set up two alarms with one hour between, for example, okay, I want her to be in bed at 8.30, so at 7.30, I need to have a, a clock ringing in order to put her in her mind that, okay, she still have one hour, and after, okay, I don't want to see her anymore. Um, <laughs> but, um, okay, so after, I don't, know, I don't know exactly where to put them. I didn't think too much where to put them, task one, task two, but maybe, maybe the, the, I don't know, after listening the, for the eggs boiling, the condition is uh, one hour, uh, she has one hour to get organized to go to bed. Uh, so task one, oh, maybe I set up my two alarms. Okay. I, I'm just thinking out loudly. No? I, uh, <laughs> uh, oof. Uh, maybe, well, even maybe I need to set up uh, three alarms because I think... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> 30 minutes, uh, why 7.30, 8 and 8.30, okay. Uh, I, I don't know. Like snooze it. button, <laughs> snooze button built in there. <laughs> yes. I don't know, maybe another participant has some idea to, to help me with this, uh, because I don't know exactly where the task, oh, no, it's not clear in my mind. <laughs> but, but this is why it's good, you see, to start to think out loud and you start thinking about what the problem is and how um, the, the steps that you can take to, to solve it. So you're already thinking on the right track. Do, do you kind of mm -hmm. see? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, because also at the, <laughs> it's not easy for the kids to have an idea of the time, you know, what is it when <laughs> I, is it soon? <laughs> she doesn't realize, okay, oh my goodness. But you know, the best is that I have a, I have a clock that, okay, there is the red color. It's a oh. timer, okay, so it's easier. It just, okay, I can just put that on the wall in the place that she will see that. And when she will see that there is not red anymore, okay, she will know that mommy will start to be mad. <laughs> <laughs> it's something that we use at school also. So and I have that, so I think it's that that I have to use. <laughs> Um, okay. Well, thanks for sharing, Benedict. Um, <laughs> anybody else? Anybody else want to share or have any questions, comments? Did you see how this is either similar or are kind of different from how you normally solve, like do problem solving? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, but at the same time, I know it's just like it's, a, it's like a recipe, you know, when you do a recipe. You yeah, know. yeah. You have to generally when you follow a recipe, you have to mm-hmm. be pretty precise if you want to get it to turn out. I know, I know for baking, for baking, mm-hmm. um, you have to be very exact and specific with measurements and and um, if you want, if, at least in my experience. <laughs> So yeah, it is a little bit more, um, I guess, detailed and specific. Right, well, thank you everybody for participating and we're gonna move on to talk about um, just, uh, we're just gonna dip our toes into um, some of the different programming languages. Um, Got a little short video here um, that's just going to talk about um, what different languages there are and why they exist for different types of um, tasks. Everything we do on computers and smartphones has some sort of code behind it telling it what to do. But have you ever thought about how this code gets written? There are thousands of different languages in the world around us, and in the digital world, things aren't so different. There are also tons of different programming languages making up the code that powers much of our technology. A programming language is made up of specific terms and directions that are used to create some kind of output, such as websites, apps, basically any kind of software. Languages like JavaScript, Python, and Java are often used by websites for a variety of different purposes. C++ is used just about everywhere to make things like desktop apps, games, and more. There's also HTML and CSS, and while these aren't technically programming languages, they're used to create the structure and appearance of almost every website out there. These are just a few of the most popular languages, but there are also many, many more. And the reason for this is that all of these languages are unique and operate differently from one another. To further explain this, let's take a look at vehicles. There are all kinds of different vehicles in the world, and most of them can get you from point A to point B but which one you choose depends on a number of factors. Some of them might be faster than others, and certain vehicles might take more skill or training to operate. In some instances, one vehicle might work better than another, like if you needed to move some bulky objects. But in a lot of cases, most modes of transportation can get the job done, and it just comes down to what you personally prefer. All of these qualities about vehicles also apply to programming languages. For example, A web developer might choose to use JavaScript because it works well with HTML, while a video game designer might choose C++ because it can handle more complex graphics. Without programming languages, most of the technology we use on a daily basis would be useless. When it comes down to it, they're simply the backbone of all of our software. Right. So um, again, that was just a really brief overview of all of of a few of the different um, programming languages. Um, Not going to go into too much um, about it, but just a little overview of the languages and syntax. Um, So programming languages were developed by people. So they have some elements that you'll recognize of what we call plain languages. Um, And again, they just have to be used in a specific way. Um, Syntax is just another way of talking about um, when text is a number, when you stop a command, it's when you have a period that may mean something specific um, in that code. Um, Just going over a couple of um, the languages that were mentioned, um, you have your HTML, that makes up basically just the content of your website. Your CSS, um, that's the it's what's going to make your website um, be a little bit more aesthetically pleasing, um, like your colors, um, like your font sizes. Um, you hear JavaScript a lot. That may be one that you've heard a lot. Um, that is what makes your website interactive. Um, and those, those three are what you're going to hear often called um, the front end language that we're going to get to in just um in just a few minutes when we're talking about how the web works and what the front end and the back end um, is. And then if you have ever heard of something called the back end, um, that's something that's talking about what goes on kind of behind the scenes. Um, 
and some of the languages that um, help um, run on the, the back end or behind the scenes are some called um, Python. You may have heard people talk about Python. Um, that's used in math. Um, it's, this, um, it's the second most popular programming language um, after JavaScript. Um, you, I've also heard of one called PHP. And that's something that's used. Um, it's a good beginner language to learn if you're wanting to work on the back end. Okay. And I'm going to go um, over very, very briefly, um, and I apologize that this is the more luxury part of, of the class, um, is how, how the web, the web works. Um, but on your screen, you should see a graphic. Um, it's got the internet cloud in the middle. Um, you've got client side on the left-hand side and server side on the right side. Um, so if you're if you're used to using the internet um, just to go to a website and or do things like posting on social media, just web surfing or going shopping, um, going online shopping, um, if you ever wondered like how that actually happens and what happens when you actually type in a website address um, in the search bar, um, I'm going to try to briefly explain the process. Um, but in its simplest form, um, what's going on? It's something called a call and response between the client, um, which is your internet browser or the front end, um, and the server where this information is going to be stored um, or on the back end. So if you see server side, just think back end, client side, think front end, um, that's or if you're what's going on in Chrome or Firefox or Safari. And the graphic that you see on your screen um, is just helpful to sort of visualize this relationship. Um, and you'll probably hear these terms interchanged a lot if you decide to continue on um, a journey into web development or programming or coding. You're going to hear those terms a lot. And it's just helpful that you understand that there's a distinction between Client side, server side, front end, back end. Um, and also you're seeing that um, I'm representing um, the client side by a laptop, um, a cell phone and um, a desktop computer. Um, basically nowadays you have, you can get on online on pretty much any kind of device. Um, and that includes these types of devices. Um, and again, it's just what you're gonna see on your screen on the client side, on the front end, um, depending on what device you're on. Um, and then on the server side, on the right-hand side of the graphic, um, that is um, simply a reference to the graphics, just a visual a visualization um, of your request. If you typing in google.com on your cell phone or your, or your laptop, um, on the right-hand side, this is just this request being fulfilled by the server. Um, or the documents, or you're going to be hearing about databases. Um, a lot of um, back-end programming lang languages deal with database bases, and that's all happening behind the scenes on the back-end. Um, and so, again, um, when you type in google.com and the website shows up on your page and your browser, um, all you're doing is asking the back end or the server side, hey, can you pull that information and bring it over to my browser so it shows up on the screen? And what that means from a coding perspective is, again, just a lot of web development is divided between these two, these two sides, client side, server side, front end, back end. And again, just knowing that there's a distinction between the two is going to help you understand um, if um, it's going to help you to see maybe what part of the of web development you want to be working in. Maybe you prefer to work on how it looks on the front end, or maybe you prefer to be behind the scenes. Any questions? Okay, I'm going to move on. Um, next, I'm just going to go over a little bit more about um, the different languages and what purposes they serve on your front end, back end, client side, server side. And again, this this graphic just kind of illustrates which, which languages go with what side. Um, so again, on the client side, front end, um, on your browser, 
you've got your HTML, which is the language that a lot of people um, start with when they're first starting out. Um, it's very, very basic. If you're like me and can remember websites from the 90s, um, they were not very, they were not, they were very static. There wasn't a whole lot going on. It just look, looks like um, a bunch of text. Um, that is probably what was used. It's just a bunch of HTML. It, no, maybe some, maybe had some flashing graphics, um, but a lot of the early, most of what your early um, websites when, as the web was, was being developed were built just using HTML. Um, then you get into CSS. Um, and that's the language that you use that um, is going to make your website more, um, uh, more attractive. Um, that's where you can actually get into more design um, elements. So if, if you are into graphic design, you may wanna start looking into things like CSS. And basically HTML and CSS, they're gonna tell, they're gonna tell a website when you're writing that code, what it's gonna look like. Um, and what words are gonna appear in the page, but it's not gonna do anything. Um, and that's where JavaScript comes in. Um, and JavaScript, again, thinking back about our brewery example um, at the beginning of this class, um, it's gonna respond to um, a user's input. And it's um, what you use if you ask someone a question and it's gonna do something different, the website's gonna interact differently based on what your response is. Um, but all three of these websites are going to work together um, to create the content, content um, the format, and the interactivity um, that we're used to when we're, we're on a website, um, whether that's on your phone or a laptop or a tablet. Um, but, and it's interesting that now that um, we're mostly on our phones now or on a mobile device, we expect to interact a lot more. We expect a more customized experience. Um, and we expect things to be remembered when we go to, by, we have our preferences set when we go to certain websites. Um, how that's done, um, from my understanding, that's all done on the back end. Or that's all done on the server side. Um, and that's what these languages and the graphic on the right, um, where you see um, those are going to help. Um, get that information back. Um, they're going to store information. Um, and they all do a little, some, a little bit, something different. Um, and it's not something that you're necessarily going to see on the front end. Um, let me just see if you've ever heard of any of, the, of these Ruby, Python, I know I mentioned that earlier, um, Perl, um, Ruby, I, you know, I believe does things with data processing. Um, Python builds websites and software um, and automates tasks. Um, PHP can um, encrypt data, collect data, can send and receive cookies. Everyone loves cookies. Um, <laughs> so all of these things do just, again, just a little bit different tasks. Um, but they're on the back end. And um, then I just had a little, um, little something to share. Um, if you're interested in web development jobs, um, you may seem, see something called full stack. That's F-U-L-L-S-T-A-C-K, full stack. Um, if you ever see that in a job description, um, basically that, that just means um, that you can work on, you know, front end and back end languages. So, and there are, there are people that, that do both. There are people that just do one side and then there are people that do both. Um, and as you start your journey, um, you may want to just pick one and figure out which one you like or you don't like or pick a side. So again, just thinking like if you're, um, if you, I think if you prefer to be more on the, the database side, you'd want to go work on the back end. And um, I do have a, a fun little activity um, at the end, just got one more, one more lecture slide, but I do have a fun little activity that, um, that can help you kind of see maybe what you're interested in. Um, any questions? Okay. Okay. Well, how it fits together. All right. So, um, so we've talked a little bit about front end, back end, and what the different languages involved, and what they do, and why we have 
languages that work on one end of uh, the client side and the languages that work on the back end. Um, but just talking about how this all fits together, um, just you need to know that there are actual three computer files. Um, so first you write out your code um, in a file and save it to into something like a text editor, like, note, like Notepad. Um, you save that as an index.html file. It's kind of like a Word document. And it's written code that will actually need to run that'll perform some processes. Um, you then put this code on a server. You load it a, a web, on a website, on a web page, and then you will have a live website. You have to run the, um, H, you have to have the HTML file before you um, have the CSS and JavaScript files, um, they have to connect through this original HTML L file, file, excuse me. Um, so a website can have um, many different pages um, and each one may have its own HTML file, but they're all gonna connect to this original index file. Um, so if you're thinking about, just think of a website that may have um, a contact us button at the top of the page. Um, if you're thinking about the code, it would actually have it's a little file called contact.html. Um, and then you're going to see in the graphic, you're going to see the box that says style.css. This is where um, all of your information about, hey, if I want my banner to be bigger, a bigger size than all the text below it, this is where you're going to be putting that information. Or if you want your um, all the text and on the, the right side of your page to be blue. This is your CSS file, and it's going to make your website more uh, stylish. Um, and then you're going to, whoops, I did not mean to do that. <laughs> Let me get back here. And then you're going to have your JavaScript file, and that's just going to have the code for um, if you're going to tell it to have, again, the pop up boxes. Um, any, anything that's interactive, that's going to be in your JavaScript file. And how you put them all together is that you take these three files, you save them, and you upload them to a server. So if you've ever heard, if you've seen those Super Bowl commercials from many, many years ago, I'm not sure if they still do Super Bowl commercials, but GoDaddy, that um, that is a server that you can put your um, your website on. Um, Amazon, I believe, has one called AWS, which probably stands for Amazon Web Services. Um, again, that's another example. Um, if you go to a college or university, um, they may have a server that you can store your information at your files on, um, or you can pay for your own personal server. Um, and generally they do have a monthly fee. And once you've gotten those files loaded to a server, then it is on the internet and it's live. Um, but before you do this, before you upload it, you can still um, open this in your text editor and see a preview of what it's gonna look like before it goes live, but nobody else can see it. So essentially the, the key to getting from, from what I understand from getting it from what, you see to where everybody else is going to be able to see it, you have to go through the server. And that's 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 kind of it. That's a very brief, basic overview of how the web works and the languages that um, make up the code that go into making up the code behind some of your favorite websites and and why we use the different languages for different purposes. And then just, um, I've got a couple of links on this last page. Um, these are just some library resources that again, if you're, if you're part of the Charlotte Mecklenburg library system, you can use these all for free with your library card. Um, LinkedIn Learning and Universal Class have wonderful um, self-guided tutorials and classes um, for all kinds of different, um, programming languages, um, web development, all kinds of professional development tools. Um, North Star Digital Literacy um, is 
some another resource that you can offer that that you can look at that offers um, assessments for things um, like different areas, different Office, Microsoft Office products. Um, and then I included just a, a link to Queen City Bytes. That's the partner that we've worked with in Charlotte for the past couple of years um, who have just been instrumental in helping us get some amazing programs out there to our community. And I would, they are continuing to offer um, either programs with the library or um, uh, meetup programs. Um, and I would just encourage you to check out their website. And then on this last quiz, uh, this last page, I do have this little, um, it's a programming personality quiz that I found um, that it's, um, it's from um, codeacademy.com, which is another great um, free resource. Um, that'll let you um, kind of explore the different languages. Um, and if you have a couple of minutes, I would um, encourage you to just check it out and it'll hopefully give you an idea of maybe um, what, if you're a front end or a back end, client side, server side type of person. Um, and I think that's all I have for you guys.